The, um, I want to start just by start with the sort of pessimistic side of my talk and hopefully engender a sense of optimism as I talk over the next 45 minutes or so. You know, I do what I do because um, I'm a clinician. I see patients every day with psychiatric problems and I frequently sit there scratching my head wondering what I'm going to do next. Um, <clears throat> because of the nature of my practice, I tend to get referred patients who have tried lots of treatments and pretty much by the time they get to me, we're often sitting there wondering what we're, what we're going to do next. And this is really a problem across psychiatry and across most mental health conditions because although we're putting a lot of fantastic and, and absolutely deserved and necessary efforts into the early identification of mental health problems, developing mental health services, what we really fundamentally lack is a broad spectrum of effective treatments for most mental health conditions. And depression's a great example of this. We all know how common depression is. We've started a great national conversation about depression in recent years. Um, we, we are seeing patients much earlier on. But in, but in no way has, is there any evidence yet that that has fundamentally changed one of the basic problems with treating depression, which is that at least a third of the patients we treat don't get better with the various treatments that we have. And once you've tried a couple of medications, you don't really get much further. Um, and disorders like PTSD, anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders are all really very much in the, in the same bag. This is some data analysed in depression from the STAR-D study. This was a big American study where they, they gave a couple of thousand patients an antidepressant. If they failed that antidepressant, they got, another, they, they got a second line of treatment, a third line of treatment and a fourth line of treatment. And on the left-hand side, it just shows the remission rate, so how likely you were to get better with your first drug, your second drug, your third and your fourth. And, you know, it's not great. It's, you know, it's 36% the first time and it, it diminishes pretty rapidly. But if you actually look at the, the, the column on the right, this is what really frightens me. This is the likelihood that that patient will be well in two years' time. And the numbers are just uh, are really quite abysmal. So we really need fundamentally to change that. And in psychiatry, we have effective forms of therapy and we have medications that work in some, in some circumstances. But this is clearly, with what we have currently, just not good enough. And, and my career and the career of many of the people I work with is dedicated to saying, well, if, we, if these things aren't good enough, what can we add to this therapeutic armamentarium to try to ensure that our patients have better options going into the future? And so our focus is really on what we call novel forms of brain stimulation. And there are lots of these. I'm going to spend most of the time today talking about transcranial magnetic stimulation, but there are about 15 forms of brain stimulation at some form of evaluation currently. So TMS has really led the vanguard as a, as a new and novel treatment for mental health conditions. So I'm going to spend most of my time talking about that today and talk about it in the context of, of depression, which is where most of the work has been done to date, and also talk a little bit towards the end about its potential use for post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, TMS is, a, is somewhat complex, but actually not all that difficult to, to grasp. It basically relies on an understanding of Faraday's law, which is the idea that if you, if you turn an electrical current on and off very quickly, it will generate a magnetic field. And so we run an electrical current through a coil that's placed on somebody's head that generates a magnetic field. Magnetic fields pass through us without any resistance. And if you apply a magnetic field to something that conducts electricity, it will induce a current if it's strong enough. So you basically go from electricity to magnetic field and back to electricity. And you get the electricity out into the brain without actually having to apply an electrical current to the brain. And depending on the shape of the coil, you can determine the field, the magnetic field shape. And if we actually put two round coils together, as you can see on the right hand side of the slide, you get this sort of um, pointed magnetic field that will pe penetrate a couple of centimetres into the brain and if you drive the electrical field initially with enough current you can actually generate a strong enough current in the brain that will make nerve cells fire. Because if we make a big bunch of thousands or probably millions of nerve cells fire multiple times and, and during a course of treatment we might provide 60 or 80,000 stimulations, we change the characteristics of those nerve cells. Locally we, we make the brain more or less excitable depending on how we stimulate but those nerves, particularly when we target the frontal areas of the brain, they project throughout the brain and you get a flow on effect. You activate distal regions in the brain and you change what we call network connectivity. Strength, you change the ability of the frontal area of the brain really to regulate other parts of the brain that are involved in things like emotional regulation. 
So when we do this in depression, what does it kind of look like from a practical perspective? Well, patients come in, they sit in a chair, this coil's placed on their head, they're there for somewhere between usually half an hour or 45 minutes a day. It's usually extremely well tolerated and quite, quite benign. There are some side effects and some patients find it uncomfortable, but, but in terms of dropout rates, the dropout rates we see with TMS are are in low single figures compared to if I put somebody on a, a new antidepressant medication, probably 15 or 20 percent of patients are, are not going to tolerate that. And they do that over a period of four to six weeks, usually in a standard course of treatment. And so does that work is obviously the critical question. And, and the, the answer clearly in 2019 is that absolutely yes, it does. This is something that's been subjected to research now for over 20 years. We have over 50 randomised controlled trials. We probably have more, um, or we actually do have more studies supporting the use of RTMS in the treatment of depression than we do for any other biomedical treatment in psychiatry where the studies have not been supported by the pharmaceutical industry. Of the literature supporting TMS, there are one or two industry-sponsored studies, but the vast majority of the research has been conducted by independent researchers sponsored by government agencies rather than by uh, kind of a, an industry um, like would support, say, for example, new antidepressant medications. So there's a very robust literature reporting supporting the acute antidepressant efficacy. There are still some issues we have to deal with about what we know about longer-term changes, but certainly there's really no doubt about what happens when you give a patient a course of treatment, and we'll talk a little bit about that. This will come sort of in, in, in relevance a little bit later on, but not all TMS is, um, is the same. There are various ways that these pulses can be applied to the brain. And we know in depression there are, there's level one evidence, so multiple clinical trials supported by positive meta-analyses, that there are at least three and probably four different ways you can successfully apply TMS. One is actually with a type of stimulation applied on the left that activates brain neurons, increases brain activity. The next one is the, exactly the opposite. It's applied on the right with a type of stimulation which actually reduces local activity. But they probably both affect prefrontal subcortical connectivity in similar sorts of ways. A third type basically combines those two, of those two treatments. And a fourth type, which is not yet in Australia, involves a, a very different sort of TMS coil that allows us to, to get stimulation into deeper brain regions. As I mentioned before, TMS is not a unitary thing. And it relies on the principle of thinking about disorders like depression or PTSD or schizophrenia, not as, not as disorders of neurochemistry. Because, you know, we, for years we talked about depression as being not enough serotonin. Now, we just know that was blatantly wrong. It was a nice, simple inference from what certain medications did, but it just wasn't true. Um, we know that disorders like... Mo actually, most, if not all, of the disorders that we see in psychiatry are disorders of complex brain networks. They involve multiple areas of the brain. And this is just a, a brief kind of expression of areas of the brain that, that are abnormally active in patients with depression. So if we understand what these networks are, which we increasingly do, and we particularly understand where the critical nodes are in these networks, which we are increasingly developing that, that, that understanding, we can then think about how we can potentially just target one area and get flow and effects around that circuitry. So in depression, it might look like stimulating prefrontal regions to try to access the subgenual anterior cingulate that seems like a really critical node. In, in PTSD, a lot of the thinking is around how you use prefrontal or orbitofrontal stimulation to try to change connect connectivity between prefrontal regions and, and the amygdala. But it's about trying to think a little bit more in a more sophisticated way about how we affect global brain activity by only stimulating relatively local areas. We see much more promise um, in a technology, in a technique called transcranial alternating cu current stimulation, which is much less proven to date but we think has a much greater um, capacity to be used um, to develop really innovative ways of changing brain activation. What TACS does is it pretty much does the same as TDCS. It causes slight changes in, in the likelihood of neuronal firing. And so we think this has got much more capacity to be potentially used therapeutically for brain conditions because, as I said before, frequencies really matter in brain activ activation. And we're increasingly understanding what those relevant frequencies are for specific disorders. So we're, we're currently doing studies with this where now, instead of patients having to come in and sit in, a, in the office or in a lab or in a, in a clinic having treatment, they can actually do this at home. 
and we personalise it. So in, for example, the study we're doing in youth depression, our patients come in, they have an EEG in our lab, we work out what their individual frequency is, then we program this little device that I've shown you. We had, we've had about 50 of these made, constructed um, by a local um, electronics company so that we can have them programmed so the patient can't change anything. They can turn it on and that's really it. And if they've turned it on today, they can't turn it on again until it's ready to, for their next treatment. And it's programmed at their individual brain frequency. So it will only work at that frequency. They have a course of treatment, then, then, then we'll re reassess. And we think this, is, this sort of technology starts to open the door for us, not to necessarily treat thousands of patients, but to treat tens or hundreds of thousands of patients. Because that's the biggest problem with TMS. No matter how good TMS goes and how widely we use it, there is still going to be an access issue that we're not going to get to everybody. And so we're particularly focusing our T TACS research on groups that are going to really struggle to get into clinics for standard sort of clinic-based care. Very young and the very old are just patients, you know, in whom getting to clinics on a daily basis is, is far more problematic. So there's lots of work going on. Um, there are areas with TMS in particular now where beyond depression where we now believe TMS is an effective treatment. We know, for example, that we can effectively treat patients with persistent voices who have a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Um, I should probably shift the, the, PT, the OCD bar in this graph to the right as well. Um, a certain type of TMS for OCD is now being clinically approved um, in the US as well, and that will gradually come to Australia. So there's research across a fairly broad spectrum but there are increasingly kind of wins within, this, within these areas. So what about in, in PTSD? And clearly, along with depression, PTSD is the other most common post-traumatic mental health um, uh, problem that we face. There has been lots of different approaches, unfortunately, in a pretty patchy way. And this was really what happened with depression and, and TMS back in the late 90s and early 2000s as well. There have been approaches to kind of really just do what we do in depression. There have been approaches to kind of do opposite things. And increasingly, we're trying to be a little bit more sophisticated and think about the circuitry, think about where in that circuitry we need to target, and try and develop approaches that are much more um, sort of individualised. But we're not really there yet. And to understand some of this, it comes back to the principle I described before, which is that we have a capacity to increase the brain, Act, increase brain activity with high frequency stimulation or to decrease it with low frequency stimulation. But those effects are local and they may not translate to what really happens with, with distal brain areas. It may, may actually not matter that much what the frequency of stimulation it is. It might just mean that we drive the circuit repeatedly enough times to induce the sorts of changes that, we want it, that we'd like to produce. There's now been a relatively small meta-analysis just trying to summarise the studies using TMS in PTSD. Um, in this analysis, they identified 18 studies. There were 11 that they could include. And they found an, that TMS overall in, in the meta-analysis did have a statistically significantly greater effect than sham at improving core PTSD symptoms. Um, low frequency forms of stimulation seem to improve both core PTSD symptoms and depression and high frequency symptoms clearly had a, had a greater effect on PTSD. Um, this this um, analysis didn't include that later study of, of high frequency versus low frequency right-sided stimulation that I presented before. So it's a, it's a little bit out of date already and that study may change the conclusion of low frequency being better because that study actually found a, a slightly divergent um, response. But anyway, it's certainly, it's certainly promising. So in summary, you know, TMS in depression is clearly an effective, safe, very well tolerated treatment and one that we need to get out to more patients because there really is a pressing clinical need and we're working very hard both at a funding and a government level and at a, at a, a clinic level to try to find models that allow patients to get access to treatment. You know, if you have to go travel into the Sydney CBD, I actually don't know the suburbs of, of Sydney very well, but I know Parramatta, is that, is that an outer suburb somewhere a long way away? You know, you're not going to do that every day for six weeks. Um, you've got to have treatment access somewhere close to home and maybe to get access to you know remote and rural areas we've got to look at home use devices as well or how we support remotely patients to get access to treatment.
In PTSD, it certainly looks promising. We, we're really where we were at probably 10 years ago with depression, where we've got lots of promise, but what we're really desperately lacking is, is one substantial multi-site trial, the sort of trial that will allow us to get sort of regulatory approval. I know there's a lot of interest in, in um, internationally where we're certainly talking to some of the groups in the US um, that work through the veterans associations and um, about trying to get some multi-site trials up and running. And so hopefully this is something we will, um, we will deal with um, over time. Thank you again for your time.